We are rolling. Yes, we can jump in whenever we <laughs> have So you're going to say, hey, oh, how do you, oh, you do your introductions after the fact. Right? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw an intro in here. Um, afterwards, yeah. We can do it now. We can do it. I can do it on set. Look at me. When I say action, turn the hit towards the camera. Action. What am I doing? Am I doing an intro? No, oh, you're just looking at the camera today. Can you just say what that is about? I'm going to do it. All right. All right. All right, Flummy Moore. What's going on, buddy? You, man. Me? No, you're the you're the man of the hour. Right here. Well, this, in all honesty, Brian, is a dismal turnout for Shady's Town Hall. It is, and by dismal we mean <laughs> zero people <laughs> we, showed up. We mean nobody is in here whatsoever. We're looking at an empty room. Maybe we got the times wrong. Was the date right on, on Facebook? Yes, it was. But <laughs> the good news, because Shady's always looking for the silver lining, the questions from the audience members ought to be pretty easy tonight. That's right. And maybe, you know, people got enough information last time, they don't need any more information. Maybe they're, they're ready to make their vote. And uh, they spread the word, and everybody said, hey, we don't need to go to the, to the next town hall. We already know what Fleming's platform is, and don't need to waste our time. It's a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, sun's out, we're going to go do something else. We can hope that that might be the case. And uh, to be honest, I wasn't expecting a big turnout with Labor Day weekend coming up. And it, like I say, it's midweek towards the end of the month. And um, yeah, school's still it, in. And people just now got their kids back home. They're, they're fixing some dinner. And I think people are just exhausted from politics. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, I know I am. It gets, yeah. it gets to be exhausting. And, and, uh, but anyway, I'm a fourth quarter guy anyway. I got a ground game for knocking on doors when it cools down in October. And you won't see a lot of yard signs and, and uh, stuff like that from the campaign. But don't underestimate our reach right. into the community. And I know I said you could probably keep that mic a little bit further away from you, but I'm going to ask you to pull it in a little bit. I'm looking at my levels versus your levels. Well, you're a bigger man than well, I Well, I mean, my voice carries yes. a little bit more. Maybe I should push mine further away. Oh. That could be... That's, the, cl that's the classic thing, you know, like when you're working sound for a band, you guys always want me to turn me up in the monitor, and actually they turn the headphones and my ass down. Yeah. That's just jacking it up. So, one. Yeah. A little bit of both. Right. <clears throat> right. Sounds like you're a sound engineer already. <laughs> I'm trying to be one. Although, like I mentioned, the last two episodes I did, the sound was horrendous because my audacity was bugging me, man. It kept it kept giving me a, a message that said there was another audio source competing for audio and, and audacity. The audacity. Yeah, audacity. Some files may be dropped or something like that. I mean, I I go to save the file, and um, half of my audio would drop out. Just blocks of audio would drop, and they were not recoverable. So I don't know what's Sounds like software. Yeah. So the election is, is it November 5th? November 5th. Tuesday, November 5th. We're going to, it's going to be Mr. Waring, Mr. Hearn, and myself on the ballot. So far, there's still a couple more days left for somebody to get into the race. I think it's... I, I thought I'd seen six. something about some female that joined the race. Is that incorrect? Or maybe I saw something else. Uh, maybe they did. I haven't seen that, but I there was a rumor that there was a female interested in running, and uh, I think her name was Miss Winslow. Okay. And uh, that would be a good thing. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was official or not, but I thought I'd seen something like that, that uh, somebody else had maybe jumped in, or they were thinking about jumping in, so who knows. But, uh, what about Brian Dale? Is he still thinking about it? No, Brian Dale is not running for mayor this time. This time? This time. All right. Well, I might run for mayor of Flagstaff here, don't know if he's here to possibly. <laughs> but not summer really at this point. I hear. Um, so what I was going to talk about is real quick, just to get this out, because the re what we were going to talk about at Town Hall tonight was my rationale for running. Right. And uh, that has to be explained. In order to know, we all have to be knowledgeable about what the mayor's role is. In our form of government, we need to remember we had a referendum, which we voted to have 
a strong council, weak mayor, former local government. So your mayor. Right, and I've seen a lot of posts recently, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but from the current mayor, uh, Johnson, Wyman Johnson. Right? Yes. <laughs> you don't see much of that guy, but uh, you know, in the beginning he was kind of out there full front and center, but uh, I don't know, past year I haven't heard, I know hear that dude, but, but he's been posting a lot of posts here lately about the reason he's not running is because of what you're about to say about the, the strong council and that he had really no say so of anything that happened in the town. Well, that's why I'm qualified to be mayor. Partly, <laughs> I mean, in all sincerity, if it were a strong mayor, former government, I wouldn't be running. I think um, actually, someone like Mr. Hearn would be a good choice for that that type of government. But we don't have that. We have a uh, strong council, which means that. Yeah, explain the difference because to me, you have a council and you have a mayor, regardless, right? Right. Whether it's strong mayor, strong council, you still got the same amount of people involved. Is it still not the same amount of votes that count, no matter whether it's strong mayor, strong council? I mean, how does that all work? Well, a strong council, I guess, I could be, um, is where the mayor has no more power than any other member than on council. So his vote carries the same weight as a council person. The only thing different is the mayor has to get elected from the votes throughout every district in the city so that he represents everybody in the town. His vote does, and that's my rationale for being mayor, is that the median income of Somerville it's $55,000 for a family. And I live below that median income. And I live from month to month. And it wasn't so long ago I used to live from day to day and it went from week to week. And as my economic condition has improved, it's gone from month to month. And so I know what it is sometimes, the struggle we have to meet our bills, our utilities, putting groceries on the table. And um, that's at least half our population. And the way the districts are cut up, most of the most of us are represented by someone who would makes far above that fifty-five thousand dollars. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. And I'm, it's a blessing, and I wish I was still on that. But there is something that happens when we, when we get comfortable. Um, we don't quite. We start forgetting about the plight of others. And I'll give you an example. Friday Tech has started a culinary arts program. That's free. That is a wonderful program that would help people train them in skills to get them jobs in the hospitality and tourism industry here in the Charleston area in the low country. It's a good program. I saw someone post on Facebook, a person of means, a merchant in town post, there's no excuse for anyone now. And I thought about that and I got on my map app I have a car, so Trident Tech is, on a good day, 30 minutes away from me for driving. Sure. If I don't have a car, for me to get to there, to, to that program, would take two hours and 35 minutes. So that would be a five hour round trip each day to get to school on a bus. Now, maybe that's an excuse, but some of us sometimes forget what others have to do in order to achieve something. And it's, I don't think the, you know, it's fair to think, say to somebody, you don't have an excuse or it's, it's easy to, easy to rise above these things. Um, right. I mean, somebody might say, well, they could spend 
five hours less watching Netflix a day because that's probably what they're doing, sitting around just doing nothing with their life. You know, five hours to go to school to get an education to better themselves is is a, an easy sacrifice. But you know, you don't know what these people's lives are like. You don't know how many kids they have. You don't know what kind of job they're having or two or three jobs they might have trying to make ends meet. Right. So do, do they have five hours to spend on a bus when they right. need to work? Yeah. That kind of thing. And so, you know, the, we definitely need to do something about transportation. But I just think before we say things, we should think about what other people have to go through to get through a day. And, and that's what my rationale for being mayor is simply that we deserve a seat at the table. Those of us that won't know what a weekly struggle is deserve a seat at the table where decisions are being made for local government. Yeah. And that's my rationale. If it were a strong mayor, where it's an executive position, like a governor, uh, to be honest with you, I don't, wouldn't want the responsibility of the administrative responsibilities that would, would, uh, yeah, would but, burden the person of that office. Right, but regardless whether it's strong mayor, strong, strong uh, council, uh, you still have a team. I mean, it's still a team effort. You would right. hope. Right, it is, but if the mayor would have more, more power, the power to, to, in a strong, a strong mayor, he would have the power over the administration of the town. In other words, uh, the town administrator would, he would be the town administrator's boss and uh, would be supervisor and have the power to hire and fire. And, uh, you know, that, that with a bigger city, I think actually I voted yes for strong mayor, but it didn't, it didn't work out that way. And when I voted, I wasn't thinking in particular of Mayor Johnson holding that office, you know, I, forever. I always thought that somebody would come along and rise up and some girl was a, a big enough city that a strong mayor might be the way to go. Right, and, and I'm not real privy to the to the politics here in Somerville, but prior to Johnson, was it a strong mayor when Collins was in there? Or is it it had been strong council for a while? Here's the situation: we like, this is probably the genius in the small council. Yeah. They actually, in a small council, if you can convince enough of the the council people to give the mayor power, that they can change it. So after this election, they could, if they like whoever's elected and say, oh, he's our guy, they can give him the powers the fact that they gave Mayor Collins. Just like that? I mean, right. it has to be a vote by the people or have No, vote? just with the council. So that's what Mayor Johnson was upset about. He got, got elected. Well, you said you voted for strong mayor, so the people had to vote to make that happen. But it didn't happen. Yeah. I vote was on the wrong end of that. But... You know, it's the will of the people. So when we have elections, there are consequences. And one of the consequences of the last election is that you have me running for mayor. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a consequence. I yeah, mean, I mean, I wouldn't be running if it, if it hadn't turned out that way. But I'm you don't think so? No, I'm, like I say, I wouldn't be qualified for that type of mayor. Yeah. But I am for this type of mayor. Well, because I, I think you should be qualified for either type. Well, I, I wouldn't want that kind of responsibility. Because, again, to me, I, I see it as a team. You know, military, 21-plus years, every base that I went to, yeah, you had a different set of, uh, of challenges, different set of people that were in place that were making decisions, and you had to fall into that. But uh, you still had to become a team member with those other people that had been there already or, or the new people that came in. And you just, you always had to just work together. And sometimes your ideas didn't get put forth, and sometimes they did. And, but it was a compromise, and it was, a, you know, you just had to figure it out. And I, I think what's happened in this last election is these people didn't figure it out. They had too many egos going on. And, right. And um, too many people wanted to, to hold the reins of the horse where they just all needed to get on the carriage and let the horse just take them, you know. Where they needed to go, take turns, take turns <laughs> driving. Yeah, something. I mean, well, so so here's it's ego, right? Well, here's I think it's ego, and, and then Somerville has, like any small southern town, probably. In South Are we Carolina, still considered a small southern town? 
and four thousand plus people, whatever. Well, they, let's say, yeah, no, no more. But the, there's a hierarchy of a power structure, and I'm not saying that in just what happens within any any city, you know, town. And people don't like change. And a lot of that was going on. I think what happened was Somerville had glided along as a small town with Mayor Myers for so long, running unopposed. They thought it was going to always be that way. And then finally, the tipping point came when there were enough people that were had no ties to some of some of them longer than 10 or 15 years, even five years, they were able to get their votes out and surprise the, uh, the established candidate didn't win. Right. And that's so, then they changed the ordinance to, so that he couldn't have the power that Mayor what Collins had. And that's where the whole rift started, and they never, they never recovered from it. I think uh, if I had a criticism from <clears throat> Mayor Johnson, was he didn't adapt to the circumstances. Uh, the way a weak mayor gets power is that he's inspirational enough to draw support from every district, and then that puts enough pressure on the individual council people be persuaded by the mayor because if the mayor is getting elected in all these districts and he has supporters in every district, if they think they're going against the mayor and they like the mayor, then it, it puts pressure on them to that they want to get reelected. Right. That's the way it works. What do you what do you think the big difference was? And I know we're, we're just kind of random, just doing a whole bunch of topics here. But what do you think the big difference was between the Collins and the Johnson? I mean, was it just that? Collins was more likable? Was he more agreeable? Was he just a nicer person? Was he more friendly? Yeah, he had a, a what was, what's the difference? His temperament, I would be say one thing, and I like I mean, Collins I was from here, here, right? Yeah. Originally, I mean, he was and he ran, not originally, but he ran the newspaper for years, and he's a... And, and Johnson was kind of an outsider, right? I mean, he just kind of came out of town. Well, he retired from the Air Force. Difference. He's an Air Force guy like you. Right. So he was a pilot probably, or something, right? Yeah, probably right. came in about the same time he did. You know, well, you were born in North Charleston, but you know some of them. Right. So, I would say I like Mayor Collins. I I didn't vote for him the first time when he ran. I voted for Dickie Myler, an old Somerville. Yeah, Myler property. You know, old Somerville guy. Something. I've known the family for years, and just mainly because I like Dickie. And then um, after Mayor. Collins got elected. My buddy from now. Yeah. Hey, how are you doing? Welcome. We got them jam packed in here today, right? <laughs> I was sitting. You're not recording this? Yes, we are, but we're okay. We're laid back. Yeah. Okay. I was sitting in my room at five after six and I said, Holy smokes! I meant to come up here tonight. Well, I didn't expect Brian to, but thank you for coming. You got any questions? Yes. All right. I do. Um, why are you running for mayor? Why am I running for mayor? Well, we, we can go over that again. No. <laughs> yeah, no, because it's a, um, my rationale for it is that we've decided that we want a, a strong council form of government. Yeah. And uh, in that type of form of government. I believe that uh, since the mayor is elected throughout every district in town, that he's, the mayor should represent those people who don't have a voice. And those people, I would say, would be the ones like myself who fall below the median income of $55,000 a year. Somebody who knows the struggle of what it is not to have health insurance, to have to pay bills, to buy books for his order in college, to pay, pay car insurance. And, and I think oftentimes we elect people who make far above that median level. Mm -hmm. And 
they sometimes uh, get so far removed from people's plights because of their own comfortable circumstances, and I'm not disparaging that. That's a blessing to them. Right. But I think it would be that those of us that do struggle deserve a seat at the table. It's just uh, the strong council setup means that the mayor is a councilman at large. Correct. So you don't really have your own set co constituents or your own set district. So everybody in town has a council person. Right. And then you're, then the mayor is just everybody's council person. Everybody's council person. And actually, I think in that form, the mayor doesn't necessarily have to weigh in on everything. Yeah. But it, the wisdom of the mayor would be to be able to break a tie and, um, and vote his conscience and, and just at least when they're at the table and, and, and discussing ordinances and fees, special fees, that those of us who, who uh, live below the median income of the town need a voice at that table. And I'll give you an example. Now we have to fund the schools and the millage rate they're sparing the homeowners and they're putting it on rental property now. I can guarantee you every person that can't afford a home that lives in Somerville will be paying more rent on their next lease because of that millage rate. So what happens is the people who can least afford to pay the fee for for the school, many of them, people who work in the service industry along the square who have zero children in school, the rents are going up. And nobody, I don't think they even, maybe they do consider that when they make decisions. You know, I don't know. I, I recently found out that I need to do more research before I, I, I post stuff. Um, the other thing, it's before county council is the um, road maintenance. And they're talking about giving everybody a $25 fee on their cars. Now, to pay with their car registration? Their right, a $25 fee. Taxes. So On top of their property tax. And everything yeah, else. So that's going to be added. To, so I believe uh, new development should be paying for the, these infrastructure things prior to that. But, that being the case, we are where we are, and the speed goes through. I was thinking, well, maybe it's a very regressive tax because it's yeah. flat, and so it hit, right. and it's, a fee is nothing more than a tax right. disguised. So what it's going to do is hit hit the least among us the hardest. And so I was thinking, you know, people with that can most afford to pay that drive Cadillac Escalades SUVs. These big trucks that weigh have a have a weight to them, the manufacturer rate yeah. that's on the on the title that you can easily access. So I was saying, why not make make it if your car is less than fifteen thousand dollars, and you're exempt from the fee, and if you, your car is worth forty thousand dollars and weighs seven and a half seven thousand five hundred pounds then that would be taxed up to as much as fifty dollars but you can't do that according to state law it's got to be a plus so, fee so, i saw the other part of that argument too was you know it's it's not just the the people that live here that are that are using these roads right. it's all the visitors that are coming in and right. tourism and stuff so yeah. how do we tax those people and get money from those guys for using our roads right where that comes back to the hospitality tax or whatever you know, you've got to figure out something else but it seems like we're penal penalizing people that live here, you know, yeah. to stay here. That makes sense, right? Right. So, which I mean, means if you're a city resident, then you're paying city taxes, you're paying county taxes, you're paying the extra twenty five dollars, you're paying. You get hit with everything, right? And if you're a county person, you're not paying the city stuff. So, but all those people are using roads. Are you rolling right now? Yeah, well, you're fine. Uh, we're, we're, sorry. 
Please beer. step around all the people, John. <laughs> John <laughs> are, are you coming here to take beer orders? Uh, no, I'm the uh, restroom like and uh, I'm going to get a beer, yeah. I can get you a beer. Yeah. Um, what do you have this like to like? Mary Narragansett. Alright, that's what I'll hold. Okay, I'll send Dan back in a minute. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Oh. That's Jonathan Dupree yeah. of Dupree Hospitality. Let's plug Jonathan here. Right. All right. Yeah. I, I have an I have another question too, if you're Absolutely. finished with your thoughts on all that. Right. I hope I answered that question. Yeah. Um I'm on the Somerville Beautification Committee. We met uh Monday night. And something that I brought up at the last town, there was a forum or something at the Rollins Edwards Center for the planning, you know, the yeah, vision. Yeah, they, yeah, I went to one of those. Okay. And um, my group, in my group, we were talking about, I brought up the um, unsightly property, you know, um, Rundown property, an overgrown property in town. So in town, we don't have homeowners associations. So the town is kind of the homeowner right. association. And I was interested in addressing some of it is slumlordness, slumlord business, of people not taking care of the their rental properties. Right. You know, somebody's living there and renting it, but the landlord does not keep keep the property up. And um, but like specifically, this isn't even a, um on Berlin G. Myers when it hits Carolina, all the way down there. I mean, it's all overgrown and it's gross and it's the grass is too high and the, all the weeds and stuff. I mean, they took a long more to cut the weeds down from the sides, but it just it just looks very unsightly. And Are you talking about the, 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 the vegetation between the vegetation. Sawmill Branch yeah. and Burlingy? Yeah. Yes. And on the other side? Yeah. Now, those are wetlands. I, 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 Right, but it I mean, it used to be when I was a kid. Yeah, you know, it is wetlands. Still. It is, but but there's a sidewalk there, so that means right. that somebody should be doing oh, um, yeah. lawn just maintenance, the grass cutting and stuff. I mean, even on Carolina, next to the bridge, on both sides of the bridge, it's just. Well, so that would be, um, and that's one of the things that I believe Mayor Johnson used to get frustrated about the mayor app absolutely has no supervision over town employees so the the um, avenue for that would be for the mayor to, to call in to the town and report that uh, the grass needs cutting you know? right so that's so if we bombard the app and say this is Right, and the mayor can bring it up, you know, in council. I, I, and there's a right way. And a is wrong the way. mayor um, on and on all the committees? Does the mayor sit as a ad hoc or whatever the word is for all of the like mm -hmm. the parks and recreation? I know there's a council person for each committee, along with the town employees. And the mayor gets to pick. Pick. They had no more. More than the council person, and he gets to pick okay. the same an individual to serve right. serve on those committees. Right, because that would be a town council function to to but, request that yes. departments do their jobs. Right, and it, exactly, and that's why I think where they ran into trouble over the last four years is that they didn't get along. Yeah, we'll talk that. with one another, and thank you. A lot of it has to do with temperament and, and, and dealing with people. You yeah, know? And we were just having that discussion when you walked in about. I was explaining that I actually didn't vote for Bill Collins the first time he ran. I voted for Dickie Myler simply because he, I like Dickie, and he's an old family friend. I voted for him, and Bill Collins won. And, I like what I was seeing. I mean, he was really he was gregarious and out in the community, and uh, could come and support our, our little stuff over at the 
Bummer's on amphitheater and you then you get up and you and Boogie with his seer sucker suit on and so I voted for him the next time and he didn't win and uh, that's when I started paying attention to the the politics of town. Yeah. And it seems to be there's a lot, a lot of ego and I think Mayor Collins the mistake he made was he didn't get the people behind the project before he went ahead with it and that's that's uh, right. I think that's where the role of the mayor is is that to help craft the vision or that everybody wants and gets the singleness of purpose together and has to be inspirational enough to communicate that and get people on board on the front end of things rather than you know push things through and say hey look what I'm doing for you guys right bringing y'all so I was for the hotel before I was against it and I think we. I think now that I'm glad we didn't. It would have been too big for our town. Right, but I mean to answer the question. I mean, you think the mayor should be involved in those types of things? The public As works. As an ambassador. And, I mean, maybe not in charge of them, but right. at least yeah, he should have his nose in there and at least helping to manage those programs, right? Right, and absolutely, yeah. And and so here's the type of mayor I'd be. Now Frank Cuthbert back during the depression. When my grandfather first moved to town, they had uh, a work project during the Depression, one of the WPA grants, and um, my grandfather got hired to do that. And part of that project was to plant azalea plants in, in the, the parks. And my grand, I remember my grandfather telling me that. He liked Mayor Cuthbert. He got right down in the dirt with those those men and, and helped plant those azaleas. And that's kind of you know, the mayor needs to be a leader, and, and he's has to be the least among everybody and have a servant's heart. But I believe not be so adversarial about everything. You know, one of the things we we have the hardest time doing in life is to confront things. Yeah. And, um, but to resolve them, let them go and move on. See, a lot of people, can, they, they can't get beyond the confrontation parts and they don't grow emotionally or spiritually. But a lot of times it's iron sharpening iron whenever two men disagree about something and they can finally get to the point where, hey, we got to agree to disagree. What's the best way forward for our business? Our, well, when the council decides on something, then the mayor jumps in and, and goes out to sell that. Plan. Right, right. And, and, and it's almost like when I was on Vestry at church, right. you don't have to air the, the conversation that take place at the table. You simply... Uh, Agree with the will of council, and, and you you don't <coughs> air your dirty laundry of, of how, how that process works. And you, you, you do try to sell it unless it's something that you just simply morally or conscious won't let you do. Right. But a lot of times, like if you don't have the votes, you don't have the votes. Sometimes it's better not to vote. Right. Uh, so you serve on any committees? The beautification committee. And besides that one? No. No. Uh, Just retired. As a mayor, the current mayor, have you worked with him? Yes. And uh, see, I, I, I think Mayor Johnson um, should be commended for giving his salary back. The way he did, regardless of what, what we might think of it. I don't know what your opinion of him is or isn't, but uh, you know, anybody doing this, I, I would hope that they'd be doing it for, for the uh, right reason. And I think he, he did, and he just got frustrated. Anyway, I, I'm thankful it was. 
anything bad to say about the man. Yeah, I mean, I think he did uh, what he could do with, with what he had worked with, right? I mean, that's all you can do. Mm-hmm. Um, I, yeah, and obviously. <laughs> I just think, uh, I don't know, sometimes I think maybe he could have been a little more agreeable with some of the other people, you know, council members and what have you, and not right. be so abrasive and, um, and just... Uh, you just got to work with what you got to work with. And like you said, if, if, if a decision is made and, and the votes are counted and, and people go this direction, you got to support that decision. You got to promote that decision. You got to go with it. Now, do you maybe you want to readdress it and uh, overturn that decision later on down the road? Yeah, but that's stuff you got to do behind closed doors and kind of make those decisions. But you got to let the public know that you're behind your council members and the people that you're working with. I mean, you, you can't have it, that infighting. It's, so the going on. town employees answer to the town council, or do the town employees answer to the town administrator? To the town administrator. And the town administrator answers, answers to, to the to council, to not the, to the mayor. And right. a strong mayor, even right. the man, administrator would answer directly to the mayor. Right. That's, that's the difference. And the mayor would have influence over who got hired and fired. Which I don't know if you've ever had to fire anybody or not, Brian, but I, I would perhaps it if it's not a good no. No, but that means those are decisions that have to be made. I mean, right. that's, that's that's what happens when you're in charge. You have to make tough decisions. Right. Yeah. And, and I don't it just bothers me when I go to town council meetings and it's like there's nobody who is accountable. You know, if there's a mistake and, you know, a project costs $50,000 more than they thought, oops, you know, well, we paid it because they'd already done the work. Well, but that doesn't seem like a great way to right. and that's, that's run a why business. I'm... So is the administrator the one that it, it, that it, the buck stops at the administrator or does the buck stop at the town council? Does the town council collectively seem to accept very little responsibility that's, or accountability for anything? That's what Mayor Johnson's argument was precisely, Mr. Gorman's, was that there ought to be one man at the will where the buck stops with that man and then instead of, like you're saying, when you have, well, I wouldn't, you know, you got six people with their hands on the wheel, then who's responsible for making the wrong turn? Yeah. Because I've seen some people, some town employees get, like, bashed, and it wasn't their decision. I mean, they right. had to go to the next person up to for approval for things, and... Yeah. Well, one thing I I I don't agree with 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 Mayor Johnson was publicly dragging those town employees into the debate. You know, like the town administrator trying to force him to take questions at the council meetings. I don't I don't I don't know if that was why. I'm not even sure what's the town administrator's purpose at town council meetings. Right, right. When we had a, um, maybe to help the conversation along, I'm just guessing from my experience on Vestry at St. Paul's, the parish administrator would be there with the rector in case the rector, you know, they had that kind of relationship so that that the council consult with with the administrator, but she she was never asked to, to you know speak or or respond. Well, that's where I get confused. I, I don't even understand the the philosophy or the reasoning behind you know strong council or strong mayor. I mean, why even have a mayor if the mayor is not the mayor? You know, why is Ribbon the mayor not the strongest? Well, see, Ribbon cuttings. Yeah, I mean, I know there's got to be checks and balances and things like that, but the mayor should be the top person, I would think. Right. Just like the president or just like the general in the, in the military or the non commissioned officer in charge or whatever. There's the person at the top. Well, and the mayor is 
you're saying it, it, the role is really ceremonial and, and a cheerleader for council. Right. That's what, you know. And the cool thing is, is I, I, I've known Walter Bailey my entire life just about. I go to church with Bill McIntosh, and we've been on opposite sides of things, but we both know us for it. I'm friends with Peter Gorman. I mean, and uh, I don't like everything anybody always does. I don't like everything I do. But I do, when I hear, think about that, I know Walter Bailey's extremely intelligent. So is Peter Gorman. They have opposing, opposing views a lot of times, but a lot of times they don't. But it just seems ludicrous if we cut people out of the conversation when they have gifts. I mean, like, for example, Peter Gorman came from San Francisco. A lot of the mindset here is that nothing good comes from San Francisco. What possibly good could come from San Francisco? Well, Peter worked in in administration in the city of San Francisco and knows a lot about planning and, and some of the mistakes that were made in San Francisco. Why not try to listen? And a lot of that has to do with temperament and, and me being from here, I understand. Well, Mr. Gorman is not an elected official. Right. Official. No, he's not, but so he has the right to express his opinion in the paper any way he wants, but I mean, if he has good advice to offer, I'm not. I guess my point would right. be, I wouldn't, wouldn't discard him out of hand just because he's Peter Gorman. <clears throat> right. You don't have to have a title or be on the board or right. be anything else. If you've got a good, a valuable opinion and, and ideas, then they, they should be used, or at least considered. Right. Everybody. And put up to a vote if that's what it takes. But yeah. Right. Or you should, I think you always should be open to input from citizens. Regardless of where they're from or their station in life, especially because I, some of the best lessons I ever learned was from people I'd never expected to learn them from. Yeah. You know, wisdom and, and people that you wouldn't expect. So, what did you think about the uh, the meeting at Bronze Center? I was in a very interesting. In- interesting group with Robbie Robbins and um, and what's his name? Another guy who's running for Charlene Sarnik's position. I remember y'all were talking about UDOs and, and uh, yeah. some, some, some serious yeah. issues. Yeah. And, um, and when I brought up cleaning up Yucky places. Blighted places. Blighted places. Um, I was totally shot down. Like, what? You're going to be rubbing the wrong, rubbing people the wrong way. Well, you know, actually, that's ironic because they used that blighted thing to tear down the laundromat, which used, yeah. used to be um, the yeah. seed store, Nugent's. Uh, what they used to call that. It was a hardware store. Nugent's Hardware Store right. was there when I was a kid. And they they called it Blight. They tore it down. The, the town bought the lot. So that's where I stand there. So, I mean, I believe that if somebody's not going to take care of their property at, at a certain point, it, where it actually is a health hazard or it's dangerous, then they, those places should be raised and and, or moved or, or bought by the town. And one example is, I wish, where the old Mercedes place yes. used to be, that we could... we could. Uh, I brought that up. That place, because I have a wonderful idea for what I'd like to see that happen to that. Wouldn't that it be into a nice a, boutique motel? Or, or that, that, what I was thinking, that's an idea, yeah. but I was thinking um, that would be a good spot for it, actually. But I was thinking, what I heard was the building is full of asbestos. Right. So they probably should take that one down. 
that I'd be for that. Other buildings have been full of asbestos and they've remediated it. Right. Recently. That's right. What's your idea for next to Sonic? Next to Sonic? Well, I mean, where the Mercedes, I didn't know oh, where the Mercedes Oh, what I was thinking place. is for um, more avant-garde indie, maybe art studios for, for art infrastructure. Um, one thing back in the 90s, a friend of mine owned a warehouse in North Charleston off Somerville Avenue, ironically. But he uh, used it for his construction business, but part of it, he just framed out some, some studio space and some really, really good bands used to rehearse in there. And I'm always seeing seeing um, people looking for space to rent for rehearsal. So I think you could probably break it into little studio rooms in the front end, bring a, put a beer garden and a tap room and uh, have good music in there all the time. Yeah. I, I have another issue to that. Okay. The gentrification of Brownsville. Ooh, yeah, that's right up my my here's what my thought on that. And I talked to um, Councilman Brown about this out at uh, Blackwater and I asked him I'm glad you mentioned that because that's part of the conversation I had at my table at that infrastructure right. meeting. Yeah. Um my concern is, what are the people that are displaced, what's going to happen to them? Sure. I mean, it's going to happen. Right. Okay. And Mr. Brown said, well, we, I think we're big enough that we, we need a housing authority in Somerville. And so I went and researched what I would do if I was kicked out of my house, I had to find a place to live. I don't know where I would go. I well, couldn't I, afford to live anywhere besides my paid for house. Right, I couldn't either. If I didn't live in a house that I, I inherited, I would be living across South Carolina now um, on on probably uh, welfare. Or doing, you know, finding jobs here or there. I'm blessed in that. But so with Brownsville, what I, we, we need to do is apprise people of their rights. They should be doing title searches now, not when this stuff starts happening, and see what the value of their house really is and what it's worth. And then I would suggest that they want to sell, sell, but have a plan. And part of my vision would be is if we could get some light rail going to St. George. I know it sounds crazy, but go that direction, let Charleston County come to us, those people could reinvest the money for their little quarter acre lot and buy some land out in Dorchester, South Carolina and hold on to their wealth. Otherwise, right. they're not going to hold on to their wealth and it's going to go away. The only way, uh, just look at what happened to a lot of the families out in Mount Pleasant. And that they'll, right, they Daniel Allen, like, everybody will say Right, right. They, they should be learning their lesson. So, a housing authority would be number one for those people who are renting there that don't own anything. Where are they going to? For the people who own that land that want to want to want to capitalize on it, I I say that's great, but they should have a have an, a plan to go someplace and reinvest that money. I was online on. Facebook with someone and um, Hunter Quinn is a builder over there that's building a lot up and down Palmetto Street on the other side of 78 and also the house is kind of down beyond um, Glover Funeral Home and yeah. all that um, and somebody on, on Positively Somerville probably said yeah they said they were going to build Somerville townhomes um, Starting at one hundred sixty-two thousand, it's like who who can really? I mean, if you can afford one hundred sixty-two thousand, that may be a small amount of money, right? But who can? But the people that 
are living in Brownsville now, many of them would not be able to afford a hundred and sixty two thousand dollar town home. Right. Yeah. Plus you're losing your it's like the whole thing is just messed up. It's people wanting it. And that's a paradigm that I don't know that anybody can change that oftentimes our hearts are ruled by the love of money rather than the yeah. love of our neighbors. It's and, and certainly not just a Somerville issue. Right, it's, right. It's, it's definitely a, a world, I mean, a statewide, nationwide, right. it's, especially it's, a tri county wide bad housing. Yeah, it's, it's not unique to this town. It's as it's old as time, I think. But we could do better. Yes, we can. One, one person, one day at a time, we can all do better. But my impression of, of the infrastructure vision plan was that it reminded me of teaching school in that we used to have these uh, contacts with parents that were almost like a dog and pony show. I almost felt like the, the vision had already been cast and we were just there to check a box off to say that public input public input if that box was checked off by the meeting and that part of it was already a lot of it had already been has already been adopted in, in the works yeah. as one person slipped up and said when their plans that they have over here on on this side of, uh, of the railroad tracks right. where the post office is that area and then he mentioned Brownsville and me I said well what uh -uh, I'd be against any of that so they're already they already got plans for Brownsville so uh, if you're going to buy a cheap when house, you say they already have plans the, I'm talking to the Chamber of Commerce the powers of being in, in the town the, the the property owners, the landlords already know what's planned for over there. You know that they're getting ready to to clean up their act and sell their property at a nice little profit. People know, so they position themselves. Something that concerned me, at least just one person said, and I said, how, how is that happening? Um, I've gone over to the community resource center and, you know, like pulled up my hair out and said, I, want, I don't want that to keep happening. Why, why aren't people raising cane? And um, one person on Facebook just recently said, they, nobody, their count, town council person had not, you know, done any publicity but not publicize that that was in the works that, that they're not that they don't hear from their town council person of what's going to happen which i feel sure like the north maple extension and stuff like why are they putting the spring station with its back to where the north maple extension is going except for it must be going in front of that and other stuff is going to be disrupted and i don't think people know well, when people and are going to find out what's... Then it's too late. It's too late. Just like yeah. I'm going to make an apocalyptic prediction right where I think it's East 6th North Street where they're putting the Audi in meets Main Street. It cuts that road that cuts, cuts across right there where the uh, bank is, that light is. The next time, once that parking lot is paved and they have it all put together and we get a range, any good amount of rain, that place, Main Street's going to flood right there every time. So you're going to have traffic crawling to a halt. Watch and see. Mm -hmm. Because they, they have, they're not planning for, for drainage and stormwater is going to be the issue that it's going to be affecting property owners. Right, yeah. because nobody's digging bigger ditches and putting in larger pipes right. when they're resurfacing roads and they're resurfacing so that water is not going to where it's supposed to be going because they've just resurfaced. I brought that to 
the mayor's chat one one month and he said, Well, you know, we do live in the low country. Well, that's a great answer. Well, that's not a great answer. The, the answer would be, and this is what I've thought about that same thing, is is it because the uh, those pipes come from manufacturers and it's just like some standard size pipe that, that's a industry well, standard? Well, 50 years ago, yeah, well, from so, when the town was a third the size that right. it is now. So don't the, the manufacturers, you could pre-order any size pipe you want to if it's good concrete, I would hope. But I don't know. See, I, I really don't. Without bears looking into, I've said the same thing. I mean, every curb cut that you walk down Main Street, there's you can't cut through it when it rains because there's a puddle of water mm -hmm. at every curb cut. I mean, I've, I've taken pictures of them. I mean, because drainage is a horrible problem. Mm -hmm. My property, I just had to replace the whole floor in my house, subflooring, and the beams underneath my house because there's been so much water damage coming down Richardson down to South Laurel to the canal mm -hmm. that um I mean my house it was just plumb right right it out. The only thing holding my floor up was the top floor. The pretty pine floor was well, how did you afford all that? There no, went I'm... my retirement. Boy that was it was expensive but but there I Yep. Yeah, I got that going on in my bathroom. Like a That's my my, my well, retirement money. Like, so yeah. I'm sorry. But but you know the boutique motel. I didn't like it because there's going to be more water flowing downhill. The the um, new office buildings. Are the new south. office building. I went out there and, and protested that because they're cutting down trees and making more parking places and building more stuff. More water going down my street. I don't know what's going to happen to the that new office building. They took the sign down and everything's gone quiet. So I haven't heard if it's still a go or not with the Summers Corner developer. Well, I think what's going on is everybody's laying low until after the election. And that the moratorium, again. you notice they, they put a moratorium on development. And that, and one thing I, I have been encouraged by is that one of the candidates is, is either coincidentally a, is taking some of the same positions I have as far as parks and recreations are concerned. And, and uh, so that's encouraging. You know, invitations flattery. Okay. I don't necessarily have to to be the next mayor, and I certainly hope whoever is, is open to right. public input, and, and uh, maybe likes some of the things I'm proposing. Yeah. But I, I do think people should go out and vote, and vote their conscience, and, and vote for whomever they think would best represent their points of view. But knowing good and well with the right expectations of what a mayor can actually accomplish. But 715. I was going to go out there and play some music. Huh? All right. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Keeping you from keeping you from doing your gig. No, you're not. In fact, I was laughing at Brian. I said the questions will be easy tonight. I won't get any. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Yeah, we appreciate you coming. I in. got I got I got a present for you. Just a little campaign. Do you have a button? Building. I gave him a button that I had to my son up in New York. He, yeah, he came down and he was so excited. I, I, have, I, have I love it. And this is a big one. I just got a little one. Well, you don't have to wear that one. I got little ones. Well, I, these for, I got, actually got these for book bags. I'm going to go to the high school. Oh, yeah. Well, here, give me just a little one. I don't have the little ones. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, but I'll grab next time. I'm trying to get rid of these. Okay. Thank you for coming. I'll stick it on here. And I'm going to actually... Don't be uh, discouraged. I'm going to get out in September and knock on doors and go through every district. And you won't see a lot of yard signs, but it doesn't mean I'm not actively campaigning. Right. I don't if you know. want to put a yard sign up, I'll put a yard sign up. Yeah, yeah I just don't want to spend the money on it, to be okay. honest with you. I was you going want to, me to make one for you? Sure. Oh, I was yeah. going to, that was one of my ideas. I have plenty of yard signs left over from, from, from the 
ones that I picked up that yeah. I never returned that I could spray paint white and we do some uh -huh. stencils. But I was going to get like six of them in, in strategic locations, some of those big ones, you know, 30 days out. And I yeah. got some spots. Um, it, but I think it's, it, I mean, the uh, results of those yard signs are more psychological than they are actually people get, you know, you can't really, they say that. They, uh, yeah. No, I don't think so. And I think they're more of an eyesore than anything. I mean, especially when it gets when crunch time. When they've already been all out there corner. for six weeks. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, Shady will not let you your yard your time. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Cast off conversation rules. 